try and keep it really, really simple as we look at, at, at works or workmanship. I really actually uh, struggled very much with this lesson uh, because one of the things I found as I, as I was thinking through, um, I wish Nathan hadn't said about how much I prepare, because uh, uh, I really struggled with this one until this week. Um, as I was looking at workmanship, I knew that the kids were studying from Nehemiah chapter 4, so I read all through Nehemiah and Esther, you know, and I'm looking at that, and oh my goodness, there's so many correlations you can make between uh, the rebuilding of the temple and what we're supposed to be doing today in the church, um, the spiritual temple, if you will. So many different directions you could go. But then also I was thinking about a craftsman and how a craftsman can be pleased by his works. And at the same time, a craftsman can be identified by his works, by his consistent quality works. Uh, and, and that's ultimately the, the direction I went. And, and, and as I went down this road, and I won't take too much more time with this, we'll get into God's word, um, as I went down this road, I realized that when we're really evaluating and reflecting on seeing the works of God in our lives individually, uh, it can get a little esoterical, I think. It can get a little, when you start looking at providence and, and these things, it can get maybe hard for some to understand. Uh, uh, so I'm going to attempt today to look at God's word and look at what God's word says about workmanship, and then maybe we can just see where we fit into that picture and what we're supposed to do in the fulfillment of his works. And we'll try and keep it simple so that we can all understand. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 7, I will say this though, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, I think sometimes we have to know our audience because Sometimes things will be hard to understand if we're not in the right place, if we haven't grown and matured to the right place, if we're not properly reflecting and, and, and doing the things, uh, the worship acts and the, the discipleship acts that we've looked at, then maybe we don't see certain things in our lives, but we can. We just have to make some course corrections. And Jesus talks about this in, in, in Matthew chapter 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Why did I, why did I go there when we're talking about works? I mentioned the word esoterical, which means you know, only a, a select group or a small number of people would understand it. God's message is, is pretty simple. It's pretty clear. But because of the distraction of sin in many people's lives, it seems hard to comprehend. Just something to, to file away as we walk through this. So we talked about craftsmen can both enjoy their works and can be identified by the works they produce. And I think we can consider God like a, a master craftsman. As I went down this road, in Greek, uh, uh, the root word that we translate it, it as, as workmanship would be poieo. Uh, it's been a while since I've studied biblical Greek, so forgive me if that's a mispronunciation, but poieo. And the definition would be a work. And we see this in the New Testament in two places. Uh, we see it translated in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, as what has been made. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And we'll circle back to that passage later. And then we see it translated as workmanship in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are one of God's works. And thankfully, thankfully, he takes great pleasure in us. When you go to the Genesis account, in Genesis chapter 1, picking it up in, in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then, behold, then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. God's creation was completed with us, with humans. And unlike every other day where God said it's good, when, when he had completed with the, the, I would consider us in his image, the pinnacle of his creation, he said this is very good. And notice that not only is he pleased with us, but we see in his image. And that's important because that means our, our eternal parts, the most important parts of us, have the capability of reflecting God to the world around us. Our lives can point to God. Unfortunately, unfortunately, man chose thousands of years ago, and many men still choose, to court sin, to disciple after sin instead of after God. And that messed things up. That wasn't very good. That wasn't very good. So I'm so glad uh, uh, Brother Brewer explained uh, predestination. I don't have to touch that now. Uh, but, but I will say that God knew this was going to happen. He had a plan. And he went ahead with that plan anyways. Those of us that will choose to work with him and be saved means so much to him that knowing we were going to mess up, knowing we were going to choose sin, he went ahead and did it anyways. We see Peter talking about this in 2 Peter, I believe the third chapter, where he discusses a day is like a thousand years and, and don't consider that God is slow in fulfilling his promise. Right? He goes, he's delaying so that more of you will be saved. We saw that same, you know, God's the same in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. We see the same kind of character about God, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when we see him uh, interacting with Abram before uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God knew who was still there to be saved. And we see this when, uh, uh, when, when the, the, the Israelites are going through and, and they're and they're, they're taking over uh, different areas of land. And God says, nope, not yet with the Amorites. Their iniquity is not yet complete. God knows when it's time. I'm jumping way ahead. But God even knows when it's time for the rise and fall of nations. He's got a plan. He's got a plan. God worked signs, events, patterns of cause and effect into his plan that are able to prompt us to pause, that are able to cause us to ponder, that are able to make us look and ask questions and consider why. In Romans chapter 1, we might as well, since we've talked about sin and, and God's plan, we might as well go to, 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 to Paul's synopsis of the fall of man. 
and I, I'll read briefly, but please follow along because it's, uh, it's a lengthy chapter. I'll read Romans chapter 1, and I'll pick it up in verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God. Excuse me, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over. We're about to get non-politically correct in the work environment. This is not woke. Maybe this is really woke. This is like Jesus woke. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Why would I read this passage in a lesson about works? This is a rather succinct history of the fall of humankind uh, from, a, from a rather perfect existence in the beginning. You know, when, when Adam was, was faced with, hey, do I want to eat this? I don't think he was thinking about giving up the natural function of his wife. I, I, I don't think sin, I don't think he realized how far sin would take him. How far sin takes us. You know, we make choices. I, I tell young people when, when, sometimes when we're studying that, you know, sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go to places you never thought you'd be. It, it starts small and, and, it, and it snowballs. And God knew this was going to happen and loved the elect enough to let the plan play out anyways. I find that amazing. That makes me feel special. Hopefully it does to you too. Do you think, well, one other thing to point out. He also talked about how during the fall, they still had, uh, C.S. Lewis would call it the God void. They still had this desire in them for order and for God. And, and they still had these questions about how and why and who. And, and, and Instead of turning to the God and his rules, they thought, eh, we'll make something God-like and follow our own rules. 
and it got worse and worse and worse. Do you think that people still follow this pattern today? Do you think people will try to fill the, the God void in their lives with something less than the Creator? And if we're not careful, can we in the church do that? Colossians 3.5, file it away for later. Go read it on your own time. Colossians 3.5, the answer is yes. We can put things in the place of God, and we can do it being here three, four times a week. Thankfully, God has made things clear. The more we observe, as, as, he, as Paul talks about in, in Romans 1, 19, through 20, 19 and 20, the more we observe the natural world around us, the more we learn uh, about science, and how unlikely, for those of you who are science readers, how unlikely the probabilities of a random occurrence actually is, the more credible things like intelligent design become. Paul proclaims that God has done this. He proclaims that God has done this, that we should seek him. These things cause us to pause. And as I mentioned before, ask these little questions like how? How did this all come to be? Why? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Who is responsible for all this? Too much order. There's just too much order here. Addressing these simple three-letter words, asking them and addressing them can lead us to God can lead us to, to accepting, wow, there's a planner, and finding his word. And ultimately, if we keep seeking, finding salvation. Now, it isn't just the physical things, as I alluded earlier. I mentioned the rise and fall of nations. These things point to a plan. And uh, my brother went here earlier a little bit. I was pleased he didn't read the whole thing. In Acts chapter 17... Paul talks about this again when he's, when he's giving this sermon at the Areopagus or, or the Sermon on Mars Hill. And I'll read it briefly, Acts 17, 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are religious in all aspects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of human hands. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and all things. And now here's where it can get a little hard for us to understand. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are also his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of, and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Does Paul mention, like he did in Romans chapter 1, the, the physical fingerprints that God has placed in his plan as works, as signs to catch our attention? Yeah. And he goes further. So that, that, that bit about appointed times and their habitations. This likely points to more than geography and implies a foreknowledge of men's lives, of nations' durations, and so forth. 
He's in control. There's a reason Paul argues that, that, that the sword is given to the government for a reason. Was it an accident that Abraham and his descendants were chosen to prepare the world for Christ? Remember that promise? In your seed, all the earth will be blessed. Was it some cosmic lottery? I liked the uh, filthy man I comment. Was it some, a cosmic lottery that Christ came at the time of the Roman Empire? He could have come a thousand years prior. He could have come a thousand years later. But he came at the perfect time with trade routes firmly established to carry the gospel quickly throughout the whole known earth. God has a way of caring for us and helping things progress in an orderly fashion. Let's call it behind the scenes. We often refer to this as God's providential care. Providence is often something we miss at the moment, but with the benefit of hindsight, it can become very clear. Both looking at world history, looking at our Bible history, which is world history, uh, and, and for those of us that serve God, reflecting on our own lives, we can see the providential fingerprints of our master. But we have to reflect. We have to ponder. Dare I say, we have to embrace the uncomfortable quiet. What do we do? when it's, you're trying to fall asleep or you're home having a quiet moment, what do we do? Do we, do we get out our Bibles and read and pray and reflect and how did I do today? Or do we turn on the TV? Or do we grab this? And we go on social media. And we never take quiet time. How much do we miss out if we're constantly distracted? You need quiet to feel discomfort. We need quiet to allow our minds to, to meditate, to focus on one thing, God's Word, and how we're looking against it. And if we're uncomfortable, that's good. That means there's something we can do about it. If we're constantly distracted, we're not growing. When we practice reflection on God's word and our lives, we get a glimpse of how God has helped us and blessed us and realizing what he's done for us. It creates great faith. And I truly believe it, it, it empowers us to do great works. And we get to share those things when appropriate. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, Verses 28 through 39, this kind of gets discussed. And we know, I love this verse, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, excuse me, to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to read that again without stumbling. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us 
from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing, other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage, Romans 8.28, really seems to lend itself to this providential care we've been talking about. And it certainly sounds like an orderly plan. And it seems that it motivated Paul to be willing to take on distresses and famines and death, whatever, the sword. He knew where he was going. And when we know how much God loves us and what he's done for us and where we're going, it can motivate us the same way. And yes, that plan may include temporary distresses and tribulations like Paul discusses here. But ultimately, God can use even those distresses and even those tribulations to still make Romans 8.28 come true, causing all of those terrible things to work together for the good, the ultimate good of those who love and serve him. They're, they're, the two do not work in vacuum separate from each other. Those of us who have sought and found God, we ought to be motivated to do something because he has works prepared for us. We looked at Ephesians 1 uh, with another brother earlier. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in ages to come he might show the unsurpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward Christ Jesus, toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, so works don't matter. No, you've got to keep reading. Read verse 10. We love to, certain segments love to take this passage and ignore verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That means we do them. We're walking with God, taking part, partnering with him in his works. I'm reminded that we can't serve two masters. God wants to redeem each one of us with the gift of his son. And those of us in Christ must embrace must embrace the works he has for us to continue in his grace. That's the discipleship thing. It doesn't stop at baptism. That is just the beginning. One of the greatest ways we can take part in winning souls today is by loving the church. John, chapter 13, 34 through 35, I'll paraphrase it probably badly. Uh, A new commandment I give to you, to love one another as I have loved you, And by this love, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How can we love Jesus and not love his body? I 
I don't think it's possible to properly resent, represent Christ to the world around us and his body not be the highest priority. How does that happen? How is Jesus number one, but then his body's not important? They're, they're, they're connected. It shouldn't be all that hard, right? We remember Genesis. We were created in his image, literally the most important parts. But disobedience, that sin, man, it detracts from our ability to shine and our ability to fully show Jesus to the world around us. So we really have to fight. We really have to fight to remove the sin in our lives so that we can become as effective as possible, so that we can truly start to reflect God again to the world around us. And it's impossible to do that alone. I've never met anybody who can do that by themselves. We truly need each other. We need that citizenship, not just in the kingdom of heaven. That citizenship starts here in the body. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 a little bit more. Let's pick it up back, back in uh, excuse me, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at the time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and the strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier and the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing up in a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. What work should we be doing? I would recommend that when you go, if you're, if, you're, if you're questioning what you should be doing, when you go back to your respective congregations of the Church of Christ, see what's not being done. What needs to be done? How can you serve the body? Do men need to be trained how to be elders? Are there Bible studies that need to happen? Do, do young ladies and, and young guys need to learn how to open up their homes? and show hospitality so that they, they, they meet that qualification? Are, are there kids' classes that need taught? Is there groundskeeping that needs done? There's, there's a wide array of jobs that need done. And that's how we show love to the body of Christ. One of the ways we show love to the body of Christ, by serving the body. And when everyone is not serving the body, when the body's not all working, that's cancer, that's sickness. When our body isn't working right together, there's problems. We call those autoimmune diseases. They're nasty. I've got a couple myself. It's not fun. It's the same in, the, in, the, in Christ's body. If we're not all working and doing our jobs, then something's lacking. And that sickness affects the entire body. Prioritize the household of God. It's your household if you belong to Christ. Prioritize it with your time and your energy. We have to make Jesus first 
in our lives. Then that spills over. It becomes really easy to shine when we're in the world because we, we bring that thought process into congruence in every aspect of our lives. We don't compartmentalize. Whether we're a, a plumber or a teacher or a police officer or whatever we do, we do it unto the glory of the Lord. And we do it His way, not man's way. We serve God first, regardless of what we do to make money. That's how our light shines before the world. What's the big deal? You know, there's plenty of people here. What's the big deal? Well, you know what? Maybe I'll start tomorrow. Maybe I'll wait. Wait until I'm older. What's the big deal? Somebody else will pick up the slack. I just like to come, I like to punch in, enjoy the show, feel holy for a little bit and leave. What's the big deal? Jesus talks about it being a big deal in Matthew chapter 9. Let's pick it up in verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in his harvest. If the Spirit of of the Lord lives in us, we ought to show compassion on the lost, and embrace his work. Try. I challenge you if, you, if you, if you're looking for laborers at your local congregation, pray for them like Jesus tells us to. Make it a daily prayer. I know how God answered that prayer for me. He made it clear. Charles, you're the laborer. Get to work. And then through our the pattern we set for others through our encouragement, through us getting motivated. You all have a circle of influence and you will motivate them. It's like, you know, you drop a a pebble in a pond, right? A ripple just goes. We can all do that. We can all do that with our words of encouragement and our behavior. In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, Pick it up in in, in, uh, verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. Now, I think, unfortunately, we can can get confused in this passage, and we we can make the faulty assumption that this is lending itself toward needing to have a paid pulpit minister everywhere, or a preacher. And certainly, I love having a paid pulpit minister. Uh, it, it's a great convenience, especially when you have a, a congregation large enough to support this. But this specific word in Greek is interpreted interchangeably in multiple places. I think it's 60-something places in the New Testament. And some places it's interpreted preach or preacher, looking at the root word. And other places it's proclaim. And I think here we need to interpret it as proclaim rather than making the mistake of thinking that this is the preacher's job. Uh, Yes, it is their job, but it's also ours. Our translators chose to use words preach, but proclaim is also accurate. This passage applies to every Christian and our responsibility to be ready to proclaim Christ 
so that the world can hear the faith that leads to salvation, the words that lead to faith and to salvation. If the Spirit of our Lord lives in us, we ought to have compassion on the lost, we ought to proclaim Him and embrace His work. I know that Matthew 7, 8 talks about he who seeks will find. But I am so thankful that at a pivotal time in my life there were godly men and women that were showing me big blaring road signs. This is the way I need to go. I understand what Paul says, that everybody's without an excuse because look, the truth has been made clear and even the creation itself but don't we want to make it easier? Don't we want more to be saved? We have a job to do. We have a work to do. Our works. Excuse me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter addresses this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll pick it up in, in, in verse 4. Therefore, oh, excuse me. And coming to him, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, and for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, And to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent amongst the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in his day of visitation. Why is it important to embrace God's work? There's a visitation coming. That's referring to God coming back. He's going to come once to judge the living and the dead. That's the judgment. What Peter calls a visitation, it's God coming to judge. God expects us to fulfill our priestly duties. Our our spiritual sacrifices are to embrace his work, both building up the body and proclaiming him so that more can be saved on the day of visitation with us. We do this to be prepared ourselves and so that our works might cause some to turn to him. Because our, the way we behave, the way we behave at work, the way we behave at school, in the marketplace, whatever, the way we love each other, and they see that when we're out and about and not stuck in here, that might cause them to give pause. That might cause them to go, I don't have a relationship like that. I don't have people who care for me like that, who love me like that. I'm missing that in my life. Why? Am I missing that in my life? What can I do about it? Who's responsible? We start asking these questions. Our works work with God's works to get people to question, to pause, 
and consider him. Make no mistake, it's not an option. It's not an option. Conforming to and embracing God's work is a requirement. We are either working with God or we're working against God. There are no bystanders at the judgment, and we're going to be judged on whether or not our works align with God's or not. If we're walking in the light, we're good. But if we're working against God, I don't want to be in that place. God allows us to be tested. God allows us to be judged now so that we can grow, so that we can be refined, so that we can be ready for that visitation. You know, understanding our sin condition, our final destination, and the need for redemption initially at times causes fear, or if we've just totally gone off the tracks and we, we you know, come to our senses and realize the direction we're headed, initially causes fear that leads to repentance. Because when you understand the truth of where evil takes us, that's a fearful place to be. That's not good. With that said, I, I hope we don't stay there. You know, nobody needs to try to survive in the spiritual emergency room, you know, where they're constantly going back and forth from this, this state of, of repentance. I love the, the passage uh, uh, Elliot shared, talking about worshiping God with a clear conscience, because it made me think, you know, if I come here not worshiping God with a clear conscience, I'm always having to focus on repentance myself, because I'm not right with God. But when I'm walking in the light with a clear conscience, then my focus turns to worshiping him and doing his works which serve other people. But you've got to have a clear conscience to do that. Otherwise, we've got to get right ourselves. It's like when you're on an airplane, they're like, put the own, your own oxygen mask on first. That's got to happen. It's got to happen spiritually. Hopefully, we get to a place where we're not living in fear of judgment. Hopefully, we get to a place where we're motivated, where we're reflecting the love of Christ to the world around us, the love of our Father to the world around us. Hopefully, real compassion for the lost and where they're headed. Hopefully, real love of the brotherhood and encouraging them becomes the motivation factor that keeps us coming here and keeps us serving and keeps us doing and not fear. There's a place for it, but that's not where we want to stay. We want to grow to embrace the love works that he does for us from a motivation of love. Embracing this and, and living in this spiritual and, 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 and psychological state blesses our entire existence. When we can move to a, from a place of, of, of fear, of judgment, to a place of love works, there's peace. That's where the fruit of the Spirit abound. And if you've lived with anxiety, if you've lived without peace, you know it's an incredibly valuable entity. And God promises it. He says, you want it? Here it is. Here's what you got to do. Come follow me. Come follow me. Until you're baptized. No. Come follow me. Until you come home. In heaven with him. That's about all I have today. We've had some phenomenal lessons. We've looked at... Brother Brewer talking about citizenship, and, and, and Elliot talks about worship, and Dan talked about discipleship, and then I talked about works. And hopefully you see that these things all interact. They all work together. It's all part of the same very organized plan. Maybe your life hasn't been congruent with God's plan. Maybe you want to fix that. You have that opportunity today.
we're happy to talk with you. I'm sure you have leaders from your respective congregations that are happy to talk with you. If you need prayers, if you need Bible studies, let us know.